Hi, everyone. Great to see you today at Wednesday Virtual Morning Report. This is Stefan Zavin. Uh, we appreciate you spending the time with us this morning, this afternoon, this evening, wherever you are in the world. Please let us know if you uh, would like to share a case or you would like to discuss a case. Um, and uh, while we wait the usual couple of minutes for people to um, warm up and say hello and, and share if they'd like to uh, um, participate today, I'll just um, share some reflections. Um, won't do any spaced clinical learning today, but I was thinking about something that, that I think might have kind of some application for everybody here. Um, so in, in parts of my job right now, I have a, several, several different roles. And I, I do a lot of clinical medicine, uh, but I also have um, uh, some responsibilities um, in the residency program as well as at the medical school. And for all of these different parts of the job, you know, uh, for all of us, like there's parts of the work that we really love, right? And that's what kind of drew us to whatever field or medicine or whatever. And then there's things that we don't necessarily love about the, the job or the role, right? And um, recently I've been struggling with uh, some of the aspects of, uh, of, of one of these roles and just wondering whether, you know, I should, um, uh, I should transition out of the, the role um, or, or, or sort of modify it in some way. But today I was just reflecting on whether I, whether we tend not to like certain parts of our jobs because we inherently aren't meant for them or will never like them, or whether we don't enjoy them as much because we're not good at those aspects yet. So when we're choosing between medical fields or again, between jobs or thinking about the jobs we have currently, um, I guess one way to think about it is, oh, this, this aspect of the work that I don't necessarily love, you know, is a reason to try to do something a little different. Um, but I decided to think of it rather as um, just a challenge and a fun project to see if I can get better at the part of the job that I don't enjoy as much and in that way learn to enjoy it more both because it's easier and I'm better at it but also just the, the process of learning right and of ha having something that you're proactively working on um, is itself enjoyable for for nerds like like all of us who who sign on to a virtual morning report so um that's my that's my commitment of the day to sort of think more about um, what I'm going to do to actually get better at the, at the parts of my jobs that I find stressful or, you know, um, because I think I'm just not as good at them. Huh. Actually, I think that that analogizes, I'm not sure that's a <laughs> word, but I think that relates well to um, everyone in the clinical problem solvers community, because I think before we started having a forum for everybody in any stage of their career, to do this skill, right? Think out loud um, in a very spontaneous way about a case you don't know about. I bet a lot of people would have said, oh, I, I, I'm not good at that. I, I don't like that part of, you know, having to be on rounds or having to be in a class with people in my training. Um, but this is this whole environment is very much oriented towards growth, right? And learning and getting better. And all of us are here today because we really do like it, right? Even if in the beginning you felt a bit nervous or insecure about it. So I think that kind of um, orientation towards learning and getting better, uh, I think it resonates a lot for even this, this next hour or so. Yeah. And then, you know, Aaron and, and company have been successful at ending neurophobia in large part because, um, you know, those Tuesdays have made us all so much more comfortable, better, right? And suddenly instead of um, neurology, you know, giving us the chills, um, it gives us fever. 
Oh, <laughs> look at that. Look at that. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. I think that's a, a nice just kick off for this for this session now. We've got one discussant. Thank you, Carl. Super excited to have you join. And we're looking for one more person to join us. And uh, if anyone has a case that they love to share, and I'll uh, emphasize um, cases that are not fully solved or not fully complete in their resolution are always welcome. I've I've really enjoyed sharing tough cases I've been dealing with uh, with with you guys in this forum. So. Um, uh, don't hold back if, if you've seen anything interesting. Cool and va awesome. Vale has a backup case um, available if anyone wants to take us through that. I was on a, on service last week. I uh, was asked to cover for for four days and had several patients that I um, as of Sunday and as of yesterday yesterday when I checked just still didn't have a diagnosis. But but hopefully they will because then um, they would be really really interesting to to learn from in this um, in this community. In fact, I'm very tempted to try to look up the, the freshest clinical data now. Hmm. So we can, we have Zavin's case or Vale has, has got a case that she could present from the files. And so we're just looking for one more person to join us in thinking out loud, uh, read this. Yay, Deirdre, awesome. Kiara, I think it was just that that insisting jump in in the chat that that got it going. Amazing. Um, do you want to, um, what do you, your call? Do you want to have Vale? Yeah, yeah Vale, why don't we have you um, share the case from our files? And um, while you're getting ready, Carl, if you want to say hi and introduce yourself again to everyone, and then Deirdre, and then we'll get started. Absolutely. Hi, friends. Nice to be back. Um, I'm Carl. I'm a medicine PGY3 at the University of Colorado. Um, currently applying for rheumatology fellowship. Interviews will start the first uh, week of September for me. All by Zoom, which I have to say is I hope that remains the way of the future because the travel is annoying. Um, but great to be back and uh, always fun to do this. Man, Carl, if you can just speak extemporaneously about a case on Zoom, I think you're just going to nail, you're going to nail the rheumatology interviews. <laughs> I um, like to think so, but thanks for that, uh, that vote of confidence, yeah. Congrats on the process and uh, yeah, the, the pending uh, fellowship plan, that'll be really exciting. It's exciting, a little scary and kind of hard to believe that I'm here. Feels like just yesterday, I was like a first day intern on the advanced heart failure service, just like wide eyed and like running around my head cut off. Amazing. Thanks, Carl. Uh, Deirdre, do you want to say hi? Hi. Um, my name is Deirdre, or D. I'm in Minnesota. I just finished MedPeds residency, and I'm taking the medicine boards in two days. So this is my little break from studying for the day. Wow. This, awesome. This, this, is a, this is a break from studying, but it's also studying. Exactly. That's what I'm telling myself. <laughs> Amazing. Glad you're here, Dee. Good luck uh, with the exam in a couple of days, too. Um, all right. We can get started. Um, do you and Carl want to pair up and go first, and then Dee and I can tackle the subsequent bit of info? Great. All right. We're all set, Bali. Great. So the chief concern is uh, skin lesions and joint pain. This is a case of, uh, you want to stop here or maybe I can give you some of the HPI? Uh, why, don't we, why don't we try just being a little bit more um, open with, with less information this time around? 
Um, we, we are trying to, we're trying to harness Aaron. We're just so impressed how with two words, he's <laughs> able to just develop a beautiful discussion. And so last week we were like, we got to be more like Aaron. Aaron is the uh, Aaron Berkowitz who facilitates neurology VMR on Tuesday, as you guys know. Okay, Aaron, go ahead. <laughs> Carl, I mean, Carl, you're Aaron now. <laughs> Well, uh, I like this as a chief concern, of course, because this could plausibly be something rheumatologic, but I think more than that, um, this really could fit into a number of our major categories. Um, anything from rheumatologic to infectious to malignancy. Um, and I think some key pieces of information we'll be looking out for in the HPI um, time, time course, obviously, um, is always paramount, but then, um, you know, I find joint pain to be kind of one of those less specific complaints. A lot of people have arthralgias for various reasons, and that may or may not be helpful. It'd be helpful to know if, like, when we get more of a history and do a physical exam, if this is actually true arthritis or synovitis versus, like, arthralgia without clinically apparent arthritis. So that will be interesting to know. And then um, just kind of zeroing in a little bit more on the skin lesions, like what is the morphology, what's the distribution? Um, I think that'll be helpful information to help us narrow because this, uh, I love this because it's pretty broad. Love it, Carl. Thanks, thanks so much. So um, yeah, joint pains, uh, I think you, you, you mentioned the first really critical distinction of arthralgia without inflammation. Um, which could be traumatic, which could be degenerative, um, which could be a side effect of medications. And sometimes it can be, um, you know, from an inflammatory, systemic inflammatory process, but manifest more as pain, as overt, you know, a synovitis with swelling, redness, limited decreased, uh, you know, range of motion, things like that. So that's one important dichotomy in approaching joint pain. Uh, another important was in, one is distribution, right? So certainly whether we're talking about monoarthritis, um, which in an acute setting is predominantly crystalline, infectious, um, sometimes uh, inflammatory, um, uh, hemorrhagic or traumatic. All of those can, can cause acute monoarthritis or oligoarthritis, um, which um, you know, becomes less specific in terms of the, the breadth of um, you know, inflammatory disorders that can cause it, um, to then kind of polyarthritis, um, and then still the distribution matters a lot. So uh, whether it's predominantly, you know, small joints of the hands and feet, um, that is more typical of rheumatoid arthritis, for example, or if it's more predominantly, you know, large joints, knees, ankles, elbows, uh, back that is more typical of, of seronegative, so the spondyloarthritis, for example. Um, and then even within the small joint distributions, you know, certain um, patterns of, for example, uh, predominantly involving the wrists and, and MCPs are typical of rheumatoid, are typical of, of hemochromatosis, even non-inflammatory conditions, whereas the involvement, uh, the, the inflammatory involvement of the distal interphalangeal joints um, is, is sort of uh, a little bit more specific towards psoriatic arthritis, for example. So, so distribution for joint pain is really important in addition to um, the, you know, um, determining whether this is uh, arthritis or just uh, arthralgias. Um, and then the, the approach, sort of broad, broad uh, approach I would paint to skin lesions is, um, you know, uh, you know, similar to yours, Carl, I guess just it's all about morphology um, if for, for in dermatology, right, as well as distribution. Um, and of course, time course, as you said, is like the single most important determinant of sort of the, the differential diagnosis. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, the last thing that came to mind that I, I want to just mention up front is um, one way to, to really get at time course, a question that I've just really, really sort of valued over and over again is just asking, has this ever happened before? Or has this or anything like this ever happened before? Because over the years, I've just been surprised and kind of burned so many times of like not asking that question early enough. And, you know, a lot of times like people, people just don't connect or don't remember like stuff that happened two years ago. And then you just like, it got better. 
you really forget about and you often don't don't connect to, to what's happening now until you're asked explicitly. So I've had so many conversations with patients that are like all about the last couple of days, the last week, the last month. And then I asked that question. And it turns out that, yes, actually, something like this happened two years ago. And it was actually like clearly part of the same process, part of the same syndrome. And it totally changes the differential, right? In terms of, again, that time course, that, that chronicity. And a lot of the autoimmune, autoinflammatory disorders are characterized by even spontaneous remissions and exacerbations, right? Even if you weren't treated definitively for something. Uh, and that kind of time course can really be a clue uh, to that category of disease, as opposed to, for example, you know, infectious etiologies that more frequently are either progressive or if they're self-limited, they're self-limited and that's it. They've, they've gone away and they don't come back later. Vale, you want to tell us a little bit more about the patient? And maybe, maybe, yeah, take us through sort of uh, most of the history, maybe, uh, but, but use your judgment, depending on the case. Okay, great. So um, this is the case of a 53-year-old man that four, four months earlier presented with right great toe redness, pain, swelling, and that was treated empirically with, oh, sorry, that was treated empirically with ciprofloxacin with no improvement. Three months earlier, developed a left knee effusion that was taken to the operating room for a washout of the left knee, and there was an amputation of the right great toe that was treated empirically with vancomycin, followed by amoxicillin and clavulanate. There was no improvement of symptoms with empiric antibiotic therapy. So uh, the patient also referred night sweats, but there were no other um, remarkable symptoms. So about the skin lesions, over the next two months following his amputation, he developed multifocal skin lesions on face and extremities. Some lesions were painful, subcutaneous nodules that sometimes erupted purulent material. And some lesions were raised erythematous plaques that occasionally had alteration. So I'm gonna give you some of the uh, past medical history as well. He was born and resides in the Saudi Stern USA, works as a supervisor of a landscaping company. He has participated in civil war reenactments. He has multiple cats that frequently scratch him and um, he is active uh, tobacco user. He doesn't consume alcohol or any other rec recreational drugs. And yeah, that's basically it. I can give you maybe in the next aliquot some pictures and some additional additional testing. Wow. <laughs> well, D, we've got a, we've had a great foundation from Carl and Zavin, and um, certainly have a, a lot more detail now. Um, if you want to just share your thoughts, kind of going through uh, some of the story Valley gave us. Yeah, interesting, <laughs> interesting social history. Um, but I think generally I'm framing him in my mind as a, an immunocompetent patient. Um, there's nothing in the history that's telling me that he's immunocompromised that we know of. Um, but it would be, you know, interesting to see more on labs or just further medical history or meds if that's actually the case. Um, I mean, it seems like inflammatory processes that are happening um, on like a subacute given the four month kind of time frame. Um, so some like inflammatory, subacute polyarthritis, it seems like. Um, his age does make me think about um, gout or uric acid crystals causing arthropathy, especially the little like purulent lesions maybe were tophi and like tophaceous gout. Um, the empiric antibiotic treatment, the fact that it didn't respond makes me think less likely about classic like strep, staph, hematogenous, uh, like septic arthritis. Um, but there are atypical infections that could be contributing. The cat does make me think of Bartonella. There's also um, other things being out like in the garden or being in dirt. Um, there's a few bacteria that live in the dirt that can cause different, more systemic type of infections. I think it begins with an F, some type of F bacteria, <laughs> but some other things. So 
um, I mean, tobacco user, no recreational drugs. Yeah, I think mostly concerned for some type of like crystalline arthropathy, um, except that the ulcerating lesions don't totally fit on the face in my mind, um, or some other type of atypical infection, including weird bacteria and possible fungus, given that he lives in the southeastern United States, is kind of what I'm thinking. Labs and imaging would be helpful. Dee, I loved, um, you did something implicitly there that I just want to kind of mirror one more time for the group, which is um, you came up with a problem representation, right? You said, presumably, I mean, a competent middle-aged man with this, you know, um, poly, or I guess we could decide if we would use the term oligoarticular in this case, because it's two perhaps larger joints in a subacute syndrome, right, with um, inflammation, right? Just both what we're sort of hearing described on the skin as well as uh, in the joints. Clearly, if he went to the OR for a washout, something very inflammatory is going on involving, you know, both the articular as well as the skin system. I just thought that was beautiful. And then you kind of went back to the foundation of uh, infectious versus inflammatory and autoimmune conditions and started layering on some of his history to favor some specific diagnoses. So I just love that approach of kind of zooming out, framing the problem, and then actually tackling um, specific categories based on, you know, what else we knew about this patient. Ooh, I'm, I'm, I... I think this could be a lot still, and we'll see if with the exam and labs we get any further. But, you know, I think now knowing about the subacute time course is very helpful because I really do think that that puts um, certain infectious etiologies and certainly and certain inflammatory etiologies on the table. Um, Every time we talk about kind of infection, uh, the, the kind of schema that I like to fall back on is really thinking about microbiologic categories and within those types of microorganisms, meaning bacteria, fungi, viruses, uh, mycobacterial disease, et cetera, what could actually be at play here. So for the subacute joint involvement with corresponding skin lesions, you know, I think in the bacterial category, um, there's a lot of potential things we need to worry about, including did he have disseminated kind of bacterial infection at some point with seeding of the joints, seeding of the skin? You know, this sounds like it's going to be much more diffuse than sort of abscesses. Um, but I think just making sure bacterial involvement, frankly, is in at play here. Uh, and then bacterial processes that are going on, but causing the joint and skin to be inflamed almost as a secondary inflammatory mechanism, I think would be important to think about. And this is where thinking about endocarditis, I think would be very important, um, being careful and making sure that, you know, what's happening in the joints and the skin sort of isn't reactive to uh, systemic infection and inflammation from, um, from endocarditis itself. I think you're very right to worry about the fungal category given his um, specific work. So kind of endemic mycoses in the Southeastern United States um, with uh, histoplasmosis can cause kind of joint and skin lesions is very important. You know, I do think um, this is where in the social history, knowing if he's the supervisor of the landscaping company, how often is he kind of actually in there working with his hands? Because certainly there's more unusual, just as you mentioned, Dee, um, molds and organisms in the soil themselves that could be at play here um, that we might need to sort of think about as having seeded his blood and thus um, his uh, kind of causing skin and, and um, knee lesions. So I, I would actually even tease out his social history a little more in terms of is he actually in there with potential like skin disruption from, from working with the plants itself. Um, mycobacterial category, I think we need to think about um, just tuberculosis. Again, it really depends. We don't have high risk exposures for that, but certainly wouldn't want to miss that as a major cause of these inflammatory lesions. I, I, with this time course, you know, I don't think a profound um, viral process makes a lot of sense. And then when we get into the autoimmune category, um, Crystal arthritis and what it can do in terms of skin manifestations with TOFI, I think is a, is a great thought, um, particularly with that first, that big toe being the first joint infected, right? Really worrying about podagra. Um, we'll see if the skin lesions fit the kind of lumpy white bump picture of TOFI, but I think that's in fa a fantastic thought. And then I think we'll have to, as we get a little more info, kind of layer on our vasculitis differential diagnosis, right? 
all of these little skin ulcerations could be from a small or a medium vessel vasculitis. So thinking about those categories when it comes to um, ANCA positive or immune complex mediated, we can really start opening up that specific differential diagnosis. And then finally, other autoimmune infectious syndromes I think we'll need to think about here. So connective tissue disease that can invo involve the joints in the skin, um, you know, from uh, lupus to, you know, rheumatoid arth arthritis causing rheumatoid nodules um, to other kind of just uh, sterile, meaning non-infectious, but inflammatory syndrome that involves both the joints and the skin. Uh, we'll have to think broadly about those categories. I have a feeling there's a lot more to dig into, so um, we will leave it at there. Um, but uh, again, kudos for sort of framing him and then looking at his specific specific life circumstances and, and seeing what we're going to start um, specifically testing with our exam and our, our labs. Bali, we'll turn it back over to you. Great discussion. So I'm going to share with you some of the lesions. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. So I have this picture. And I also have this one. Okay, um, let me know maybe when I can stop sharing my screen and I can give you some of the information about the labs that were done. Um, cool. Okay. So, some initial testing. Um, his white blood count was 10.2 with a differential of 87% of PMNs, 4% lymphocytes, and 3% eosinophils. His hemoglobin was 8, and his platelets were uh, 540. His CMP was unremarkable but his ES, ESR was 104 and CRP was 221. So some infectious disease serology was done. Um, the HIV screening was negative. RPR was non-reactive. Serum, serum cryptococcal antigen was negative as well as his plasma antibody and hepatite, hepatitis B and C serologies. Anna and Anka were negative and the complements were normal. So maybe we're gonna stop here or um, I have some imaging as well that I could show you. Uh, let's, uh, let's stop here. Um, vale, anything, uh, anything on the exam, physical exam you wanna share now or later? Or were the skin stuff the only things? Yeah, the, the skin pictures were the only part of the exam in the document, sorry. Okay, um, I guess maybe we can assume some pertinent negatives like no, you know, peripheral kind of embolic uh, phenomena and then no arthritis elsewhere. Yeah, I really don't have um, any other information. Sorry. Okay, I, okay, Got, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, the pictures. Thank, thank you, Vanna. Uh, Carl, uh, what do you think about the, the appearance of that rash as well as the labs? I have to say, and this is kind of intentionally anchoring a little bit by reading the chat. I'm like so on the blastomycosis train right now. Um, there's a lot of things that fit with this. Number one, it's this kind of sort of, he's this gentleman has this like sort of protean uh, subacute sy systemic symptoms, inflammatory syndrome, kind of nonspecific. But then in particular, the joint involvement, um, the lack of like anything really striking on the CBC. Um, and then zeroing in on these skin lesions. The skin lesions of blasto are classically described to my understanding as kind of verrucous or wart-like, um, irregular kind of purplish gray in color. Um, plus or minus maybe can be sort of ulcerated. I would describe what we saw in the picture as definitely ulcerated lesions, but um, I think there's a lot that is going for that um, if you put all those things together. And just thinking like, what are our competing diagnoses and our differentials, especially now that we have some information. Um, you know, certainly other endemic mycoses. Um, Coccidio is, I think, definitely still on my list, um, as other folks have mentioned. 
TV, you know, we really can't exclude that until we, um, you know, work that up a little bit further. Vasculitis, you know, still not impossible, but um, we have now lower probability of like an ANCA positive vasculitis or a cryoglobulinemia with normal complements. That's pretty, um, pretty sensitive and specific for that. Wonder if they checked a rheumatoid factor also, but kind of beside the point. Um, so those were kind of some things that were initially high on my differential. And then, you know, something like a uh, atypical presentation of a lymphoma, like a mycosis fungoides. Um, well, the skin lesions, I guess, could be compatible with that. I don't know about frank arthritis being part of that syndrome. So of kind of that set of diagnoses, I'm, I'm on the endemic mycosis train right now. And I think like, if I had this patient um, on my team, I would kind of like go for that until proven otherwise, maybe consider like even empiric treatment while we were um, awaiting some of those infectious studies. And I think to that end also like seeing if this guy's got any pulmonary involvement because that's the most common organ system with uh, that set of diseases. So like getting some imaging of his chest, which I think we're about to get, um, making sure he's not hypoxic, that sort of thing. Those are my thoughts at this juncture. That was amazing, Carl. Um, I, I, I couldn't have uh, um, shared a better, better discussion there. I agree 100%. I'm, 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 I'm your, what's the, what's the first mate of the conductor called mm, on this train? I don't know. Does the conductor have a first mate or in, is it just the a, engineer? I'm know. the engineer on your Blasto train. Okay. Can I, will you hire me as your, as your engineer? Absolutely. Yes. All aboard. Okay. Thank you. Choo -choo. All aboard. Um, no, I think, I think you're, you're, you're spot on. I think the syndrome, uh, you, even if it's not the most classic presentation of it, it, it fits that, that, you know, the, this, the appearance of those lesions to me too, from, from just what I've kind of learned and seen in books. Um, that's how it's supposed to look. And, um, I, uh, you know, when it comes to vasculitis and skin manifestations, uh, I found it really helpful to, when I learned that, you know, the typical small vessel vasculitides like your ankas and your cryos um, manifest differently. Usually they're kind of petechial purpuric lesions, right, in the more kind of gravity dependent uh, regions. By contrast, medium vessel vasculitides, you know, like polyarteritis nodosa, present with nodules and ulcers. Um, and, and similarly, other vasculopathies um, like antiphospholipid syndrome can cause, you know, skin lesions similar to, um, uh, you know, what, what we saw on the shin. Same with like calciphylaxis. If this was a different sort of patient, it can look like that kind of necrotic sort of SRE, um, you know, skin lesion. But the one on the nose, um, that, that very typical warty appearance, I think, is um, it is not really consistent with, with those, um, with those disease processes. And then the kind of like mono and then biarticular involvement. Also, I just don't, don't think with, with enough inflammation to, to, to involve a surgeon, right. And an operating room is just not, not how, you know, vasculitic arthritis, uh, presents. Um, I do want to reflect to what extent we're all on this train because of the first sentence of the HPI or the social history, wherever we heard that the, the patient is in the Southeastern United States. I feel like as soon as we hear the regionality of the United States, not described as a state or a city or, but as a, as a, as a North South kind of hmm. region, People use that verbiage in the setting of thinking about the, this, the endemic distribution of, of coxy versus histo versus blasto, right? Midwest, the permission yeah. from the Midwest, right? Yeah. From, yeah. From, the, from the Western, you know, from the Western United States. Maybe so, they're just trying to protect HIPAA and not say what city they live in. Maybe, but I think it's, uh, I, I've said this before and, I, and I, it bears repeating that we're so susceptible to that kind of framing. Um, and uh, especially in a learning environment when cases are presented to us for the first time, uh, you know, not from the patient directly who would never say, I reside in the Southeastern United States, right? But, but, but via a, a colleague, a, a trainee, whatever, it's, it's so important to recognize to what extent we, we, you know, we kind of anchor to, to that um, clue. 
Um, Steph and I, um, years ago now, uh, did a study that we uh, never published shamefully, where we actually created a human diagnosis project uh, case that was very um, nonspecific. It was a sort of a nonspecific febrile headachey kind of illness, okay, with that with some sort of pertinent negatives that that didn't clearly localize a source. All right, and at the Society of uh, Hospital Medicine national meeting. We were in a room of about 60, 70 hospitalists, maybe a few residents. And we divided the group in two by their birthday, by their birth month, uh, thus, you know, randomly splitting them. And for half of them, we asked them to sort of close their eyes. And the other half, we projected an, an image of a grassy field and a guy walking through it. Okay, then those people closed their eyes and the other half of the room opened their eyes and we projected an image of a desert landscape and like a cactus and a tumbleweed. And then everybody and then we took the image down and everybody opened their eyes and they all solved this case. We, sh we said nothing except to show them those pictures. The distribution of people who thought this nonspecific febrile headache illness was Lyme disease versus coxy was like like completely different the people who saw the grass like all of them thought of lime and nobody thought of coxy okay the people who saw the desert landscape all of them thought of coxy that was like the top thing nobody thought of lime all right so uh we are just so <laughs> prone to this kind of sort of availability and, and framing uh heuristics uh that i just want to kind of point out uh why so many people are on this train and even though I think it's the train headed to the right destination, um, uh, you know, but, 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 but don't think of this necessarily as a bias, right? Think of it also as a potentially helpful heuristic. We're probably, I think we are on the right train and, and we are on the right train in part because we, you know, we were helped along with this problem representation with this framing of the geographic setting. Okay. Let's proceed. Okay, so um, imaging studies include an MRI of the left leg that showed abnormal marrow signal in the tibia and bones of the forefoot with osteomyelitis of the left fourth toe and multiple collections in the soft tissues read as compatible with abscesses. A CT of the chest showed innumerable randomly distributed bilateral pulmonary nodules. I can show you the imaging if you would like, or maybe sure. I can give you, okay. So I'm gonna share my screen again. It was the MRI of the tibia. So that is, so the, the fibula, just to make sure, the fibula next to it is totally normal. Just the tibia has yeah. that huge uh, lesion in it. Okay, thank you. Yes, and this is the CT with a multitude of nodules. Okay. Okay, so there was some tissue sampling he underwent bronchoscopy with transbronchial biopsy, a skin biopsy, and amputation of the left fourth toe. Histopathology of all three sides showed necrotizing granulomatous inflammation. Um, acid fast bacilli stain of the tissues showed no acid fast bacilli. And GMS stain of the tissues showed. Oh, no, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to give you this just yet. So uh, that's um, information I have for you. And the next one, it will be the, the final aliquot. Okay. All right, Dee, what do you think of uh, the imaging? But certainly if there's anything earlier too um, that has affected your thinking through this case. I think the imaging just kind of supported what was discussed during the last aliquot in my mind. Um, I mean, he didn't have any respiratory symptoms and it seemed we're inferring like a negative pulmonary exam, but I think Blasco and a few other fungi can cause 
disseminated pulmonary disease without, you know, overt respiratory symptoms. Um, yeah, I think, you know, he was treated presumably with antibiotics that should have covered most of the classic bacteria that I would think of in osteomyelitis. He had a fluoroquinolone and good staph and strep and MRSA coverage. So, and anaerobic coverage. So I, you know, presumably he got good durations of those. So that would have covered most of the more classic osteomyelitis cases that I've seen. Um, so I think, yeah, this to me it does support a uh, fungal pathogen and infectious process. I think his hemoglobin of eight, um, you know, would lean on anemia of chronic disease. Sorry, I think there's an airplane going ahead. Um, and elevated inflammatory markers. Yeah, I think it all fits with kind of the last last discussion. There's nothing that really came to my mind. The AFB seem being negative. You know, I'm not surprised about. Yeah, I think just, I'm on that train too. Yeah, I think as we talked about before, sort of multi-system involvement with um, uh, kind of focal ulcerated and scabbed skin lesions now with diffuse pulmonary nodules and um, pretty striking osteomyelitis and, and skin abscesses. You know, I think uh, mycoses still fit well kind of for that potential syndrome. Um, I, I do think uh, tuberculous disease has dropped lower given just a, a lot of the things we've learned about the history and certainly the skin findings. Um, but just pointing out the AFB stain being negative does shouldn't necessarily close that. I think making sure we've got um, PCR testing for TB as well as culture from the areas that are sampled would be an important next step just to make sure we don't miss tuberculous inflammation of all of these different organ systems. Um, um, and uh, I think the kind of other, uh, you know, just sort of going back to that bacterial category, you, you mentioned, yeah, he's gotten a lot of antibiotics. Most bacterial things have gotten better. Um, you know, kind of um, more unusual or fastidious bacterial organisms um, that wouldn't have grown usually or have been treated. You know, I think at this point, now that we know the pathologic injury is necrotizing granulomas, it's very helpful, right? We can really think of what chronic, chronic inflammatory processes, but I'm just reflecting back earlier in our bacterial category, right? We have some animal exposures at home. I think early on making sure we're being very thorough thinking about, um, uh, like Bartonella testing um, and then other bacterial organisms that can happen with kind of cats bites or scratches. So like Pasturella causing can cause diffuse uh, involvement with skin as well as bone lesions. Rare and should have been treated by the, um, by the beta lactams that he's gotten along the way. Um, but just making sure in our bacterial category, we've kind of really thought about layering his social history on with some of the pathogens that might not be thought of as, as quickly. So, you know, we have pulled away from our auto-inflammatory, our autoimmune category quite a bit with some of these negative um, evaluations here. I think that's appropriate at this point and really moving forward, having really good microbiome diagnostics on it relying ultimately on culture, but right, if there's any sort of PCR or other um, antibody serology-based assays, making sure we recognize our testing is not 100% sensitive most often in many infectious categories. So making sure we're being thorough about testing in every way we can with both tissue and serum tests for the organisms we're worried about. Um, but Valley, let's, let's, sounds like we're, we're kind of near the end here. I guess as a group, should we, um, Put our money down. Are we? Seems like we're all pretty, um, pretty confident. Blasto will fit well, but just want to give one more shot and see um, anything else. Really, we would be worried about. I don't know, Carl. I see you nodding there. I think we've been feeling pretty good about the case you guys are building for that. Davin, anything else? No, I, I like. I was just looking at the chat. I just pulled up the chat and and some some great discussion and um, ideas there as always. Um, I think. Um, Colleen's thought about nocardia is fantastic. Uh, it's often kind of uh, diagnosed late, but anytime you see um, any, any two out of the three most commonly involved organs, you know, lungs, CNS, and skin um, with sort of atypical presentation, you should consider nocardia. Um, uh, but Steph's comment about the 
What, what word did you use? Pathologic signature? Mm -hmm. Injury pattern, whatever. The, I think the granulomas are, are ex extremely helpful and really narrow down to, you know, either mycobacterial, fungal, sarcoid, or, um, uh, but actually there's, I guess it's broader, Bartonella could look like that, right? Mm, and and then some of the, some of the vasculitides, but um, the caseating also is, is helpful and points more towards the infectious rather than non-infectious mm. um, lesions here. So, um, yeah, uh, and then uh, I'm, the lush mania, I, 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 uh, I'm still not super, just don't have a super rich uh, illness script for, but I think someone mentioned that just um, uh, geography, you know, doesn't, doesn't favor that as much. But uh, Vale, tell us, uh, tell us what the stain uh, showed and what the diagnosis was and uh, what other teaching points um, the, you want to share about it. Yeah, so um, the histoplasma urine antigen was positive at 2.17. And the um, blastomyces urine antigen was positive at 1.55. And the GMS stain of the tissue samples that I mentioned in the last adequate showed broad base budding in yeast. And so the final diagnosis was blastomyces dermatitis by DNA sequencing. And the patient initiated therapy with uh, atraconazole, which is the therapy of choice, which he took for one year with complete, complete resolution of his skin lesions um, of the lungs and bone findings as well, and normalization of his serum antigen levels. So some teaching points that I found interesting were that um, when it comes to the diagnosis of lastomycosis, it is usually diagnosed by culture, antigen detection, or histopathology that shows the classic broad-based budding yeast. But the histoplasma urine antigen cross-reacts with plastomyces, so it's something to keep in mind. And a diagnostic, diagnostic pearl as well is that with the exception of coccidiomycosis, antibody tests for endemic fungi are notoriously insensitive and non-specific and should not be relied upon for ruling in or ruling out their diagnosis. So that was the case and really great discussion. Thank you, Vali. Thanks for um, sharing that one from the files. And uh, Kiara, we'll turn it over to you for some teaching point summary. Hey, amazing case, Vali. You saved the day. This was a very, very beautiful case. So some teaching points for today is that we start with the middle-aged men, uh, right? Like Dee uh, told us, this was a, a middle-aged man, which probably immunocompetent uh, status, which started with a subacute um, complaint of skin lesions and joint pain. So the discussion started with Carl telling, uh, telling us that joint pain can be like we 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 need to to be sure if this is like a true a true arthritis or this is just like a kind of arthralgia. So also Sabin told us that it is important when we have joint pain to think about the distribution because this can be like mono, just involving one, one, one joint. And mono can be composed of crystalline uh, diseases, infections, inflammatory, hemorrhagic, traumatic. Also, we can find oligo, oligo distribution, which is less common, and polyarticular poly poly compromise, which is a little more common, which can we can classify it also if this involves small or large joints, or it is proximal or it is distal, so we have to classify it a lot. And then we had skin lesions that also, when we have skin lesions, we have to, I'm sorry for the noise. When we have skin lesions, we have to, to think about, it, about this morphology and distribution. And when we have morphology, we had this, these images that Valor presented to us that this was like a kind of varicose, pustulous skin lesion that presented uh, like in exposed areas, like in the nose or the or the, any kind of right skin, legs. So this kind of lesions was a little compatible probably with histo or, or blasto, like in the image here, it, it is present. So then we 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 had a like a beautiful Venn diagram joining like the joint and skin skin complaints. So when we have joint 
compromise and skin lesions, we have to think about endocarditis, endemic mycosis, like in this case, like histoblastococci, et cetera. Uh, also, we, don't, we cannot rule out TB. Also, we, can, we have to think about crystal arthritis. Uh, for in, in example, in this case, like gout, because this was presented first, like in a big toe. Also, we can we can we have to think about vasculitis, some connective connective tissue diseases like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, and also mycosis fungoides that Carl told us. Then, after all of the all of the information that Val gave us, we had to collect clues, and we also find that this patient had bilateral lung nodules and necrotizing granulomas. So, when we have those things, we don't have we cannot miss tuberculosis, but we also can have like no TB bacteria, most of them present, presenting with non-cassiating granulomas. We also have to think about pastorola, nocardia, fungal, fungal infections like coxiblasto in this case, or histo, and also sarcoid, but sarcoid also presents without cassiating granulomas. So these are the teaching points for today. Thank you so much, Vale, and Carl and D and Steph and Sabin for the amazing discussion. Thanks to all of you guys. It was a great uh, Wednesday discussion as always, and uh, we will see you next time. Have a great day. Bye. Great work, everyone. Thanks. D, good luck. You're going to be great. There's going to be a Blasto question. You got it. I you got the Blasto question. <laughs> I know it. Take care, everyone. <laughs>